section. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm um, Jennifer Ponce de Leon. And um, next we're just going to be, uh, we're going to talk a bit about some of our current work that is most pertinent to what we're going to be covering in the workshop. And also to give you just a sense of our um, respective and collaborative research. So much of our um, work has been driven by an interest in ideology and the utility that historical materialist thought has on this topic. So this is at the center of a book that we are um, currently co-authoring, provisionally titled Revolutionizing Aesthetics. Um, part of the first part of this book, which deals with ideology, we've published a version of this in a, an article um, titled Towards a Compositional Model of Ideology, in which we talk about um, among other things, how ideology is multifaceted, how it, how a kind of the Marxist account of ideology isn't just about ideas, it isn't just about conscious, um, our, you know, conscious life, but it's also dealing with senses, affect, habit, desire, perception, um, and that, and this provides an incredibly useful framework um, for a lot of different, uh, you know, arenas in which we work. Now, one of the reasons why um, we both have been drawn to uh, the, you know, the Marxist theory of ideology is because of the way that it accounts for the dialectic of subjective and objective forces, showing how we are composed beings, composed by the world that, and, that we live in, who also collectively participate in the composition of the world. And this is evidenced in the theoretical and methodological insistence that ideology critique must entail a critique of the ways objective conditions shape subjective experience. And while these objective forms, forces are primary, it is also the case that our very apprehension of objective reality is mediated by subjective forces. Now, um, in the book In Progress, uh, we argue that aesthetic experience, which appeals to sense perception, is essentially a component of ideology and should therefore be analyzed accordingly. And this is a departure, obviously, from um, a lot of bourgeois aesthetic theories that insist that aesthetic experience occupies a distinct realm of sense and judgment that is not determined by objective conditions of the social world, but is somehow abstracted from them. And such a view is even held by some Western Marxists. Uh, we argue instead that the very fact that bourgeois ideology has presented aesthetics in this way is precisely to preserve it as a bastion of superstition that frequently serves to naturalize cultural and social hierarchies. And others have made the similar point about the systemic mythifications of the aesthetic in arguing that high culture comes to occupy the place of religion in secular societies, essentially. Um, this co-authored book uh, also draws on our own respective work. In my case, I have for about 20 years been doing research on the politics of aesthetics in the sense of looking at contemporary post-60s art practices that are materially and ideologically linked to leftist social movements in Mexico, Argentina, uh, Brazil, and the US. And that was the topic um, of my book, Another Aesthetics is Possible. And then Gabriel's going to talk a bit about how this draws on his work. Yeah, so in my own case, a lot of my research, at least as I currently understand it, uh, has taken the form of an objective ideology critique. What I mean by that is an attempt to situate subjective practices. These can be political practices, artistic practices, cultural practices on the part of individuals within the objective systems that condition them. And I've always done this in a kind of dialectical manner, uh, and that's a non-reductive manner, meaning that I examine the complex play of forces between agencies involved at a subjective level and then the conditions operative within the objective world. More specifically, and this will be germane to some of the later discussions in the workshop, I focus on the history of the bourgeois cultural apparatus. And that apparatus, I think, is best understood as the entire system of production, distribution, and consumption of culture that is driven by the capitalist world. It includes all of the material forces operative in the production of cultural products and practices, their distribution within the larger social field, and then their consumption by those who engage with them. It therefore includes a material history of universities 
as sites for the production, circulation, and consumption of ideas, but also of museums and art galleries, which are important institutional forces for the production, circulation, and consumption of art and culture, as well as publishing houses, the mass media, digital platforms, and much more. Uh, and this is just to name a few of the institutions, not all of the kind of economic forces, technologies, and other factors that go into the bourgeois cultural apparatus. Now, this concept, I think, is important because in the work that I've been doing, and as well the work I've been collaborating with Jennifer on, there's a way in which the Marxist tradition has theorized the superstructure, meaning the ensemble of ideologies that are produced by an economic mode of production, in terms of two fundamental features. Uh, Marx lays this out in the contribution to uh, his critique of political economy. There's the legal and political superstructure on the one hand, so the institutionalized bourgeois state and the legal apparatus that goes with that. And then there's also what Marx refers to as definite forms of social consciousness. And in other writings, he references religion, philosophy, morality, etc. The notion of the bourgeois cultural apparatus, I think, is important because what it foregrounds is the set of material institutions and material forces that format social consciousness. How is ideology produced? Is it just mechanically emerge out of an economic mode of production? No, of course not. It emerges out of an institutional and material complex that formats people and makes them think, feel, perceive, desire in particular ways. So more specifically, one of the questions of my research has always been, uh, how does the bourgeois cultural apparatus and all of its different forms format the ideological experience of subjects such that they have an organic or spontaneous experience of something called art, or they have a relationship to a whole series of theoretical practices and theoretical dispositions that go unquestioned because they're the nature of certain games that are played within the institutions within which they find themselves. In that regard, uh, my particular interest then is in the material forms of knowledge and cultural production under capitalism. Uh, in order to introduce more specifically some of the current work that I've been doing, I'd like to focus on, and this will eventually lead to a discussion of Rodney and Lasordo, if you're wondering what the relationship is to the readings that we've assigned. I'd like to briefly take a foray into a specific manifestation of the material construction of knowledge and how it has an impact on the way in which we tend to perceive and think the world if we're trained within capitalist institutions. That specific example is, and I'm going to go over this very, very quickly, but it's based on decades of research and my first and third book, both Logique d'Histoire and then Interventions in Contemporary Thought, lay this out in some detail. Uh, because over the last four centuries, the way in which knowledge has been produced has changed quite radically. And I'd like to highlight a few of them in order to juxtapose them to the methodology that Rodney and Lasordo are advocating for, namely that of dialectical and historical materialism. A very good example of this is one of the disciplines, I've been trained in philosophy and basically the historical social sciences, but one of the disciplines I've been trained in philosophy often tells this story about how the history of philosophy goes back to the ancient Greeks, and there's been this conversation across the centuries in which people are communicating with one another. This is a bunch of nonsense if you actually know anything about material history. Uh, the concept of philosophy in the 17th century was more or less coextensive with the, in the Latin, philosophia meant more or less the same thing as, uh, as science. Newton. Isaac Newton was a philosopher, just like Descartes was a philosopher, but Descartes was considered a philosopher because he was investigating the physical world. And so the very field of philosophy was consubstantial with the field of the natural sciences. And what happened in the course of time from, you know, beginning with the scientific revolution, but then intensifying through the course of the 17th and the 18th centuries, is that the natural sciences began to gain so much traction that they were subjecting theoretical claims to empirical verification. And that empirical verification started to call into question a whole series of theories 
particularly Aristotelian theories about the nature of the world. And the natural sciences began to take positions that carved out space away from philosophy. And in doing that, there uh, emerged a very fundamental split that continues to inhabit the way in which knowledge functions within the capitalist academy between the so-called natural sciences on the one hand and the realm of philosophy, or more specifically, the kind of general humanities on the other, which corresponds to an ontological distinction between the world that's out there and the mind, or objectivity and subjectivity. The reason that I highlight this is because this division does not go without saying. And one of the most important contributions of the, the Marxist tradition has been, beginning in the mid-19th and then developing in the late 19th century, rejecting this fundamental opposition between world and mind, between an objective reality out there and uh, the kind of realm of the humanities, which would be the spiritual realm of human existence that is irreducible to scientific analysis, through what they call dialectical materials. We, as beings, are part of the natural world. Just stop drinking water or breathing for a little while, and you'll figure it out very quickly. But as members of the natural world, we also have an enormous impact on that natural world, which of course you've seen with what people call the Anthropocene, or more specifically the Capitalocene, meaning the impact of capitalist social relations on the transformation of nature, which is now palpable within the uh, geological record. In that regard, dialectical materialism also calls into question the assumption that there's just a world out there and a world over here. By opposing to that, the understanding that there's a dialectical relationship between the way in which our minds work and the natural world within which they operate, and that we need an account of that dialectical relationship. And in particular, in the current moment, dialectical materialism is absolutely essential if we want to solve something like the ecological crisis. We have to see human beings as part of a natural world that they're destroying because of the socioeconomic system that some of those human beings have helped produce and most human beings have been subjected to in various ways. Now, again, I'm going to be very quick on this, but the other important development that happened through the course of the 19th century, and particularly in the latter third of the 19th century, was the emergence of social sciences. And the social sciences, in many ways, and here I'm drawing on a very large body of literature that I'd be happy to share with you, is partially a reaction to the fact that the bourgeois revolutions of the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century called into question the kind of stable social order and demonstrated that very uh, fundamental aspects of political and social reality could be changed because they were products themselves of history. And therefore, society wasn't the same thing as the natural order. And it wasn't natural that there'd be the wealthy and the poor, or that men would be in control and women would not, or that white people would rule the world, or the world and that racialized groups would not. All of these were recognized as social constructs that were radically called into question in various ways in bourgeois revolutions, many of which were driven in certain cases by the working class, but ultimately hijacked by the bourgeois class that emerged as the new ruling class. What this meant is that the social sciences, as they emerged, were an attempt to develop tools of analysis to explain a social world that wasn't simply modeled on a natural world, but followed its own internal rules. What's interesting about the development of the social sciences is given that they emerged within a capitalist world, they were saturated with bourgeois ideology through and through. One key element of that is the assumption that you could analyze the social world by beginning from the point of view of separating autonomous spheres of society. You'd have economics, which would be a separate sphere from politics, which itself would be separate from society. So you have economics, political science, and sociology as three key social sciences. This assumption, in and of itself, begins with a very false premise, and that is that all of these spheres function independently. In that regard, remaining within the confines and the silos of the disciplinary apparatus is not simply accepting blinders in the research that you do, it's actually accepting fundamental principles of liberal ideology. Another important aspect of this 
is two other very significant disciplines that emerged also in the 19th century within the capitalist world were anthropology and what was referred to as Orientalism. Anthropology was the specific discipline that was used to analyze underdeveloped peoples, the savages, the barbarians, those who didn't have developed societies, and so we didn't need a political science, an economy, and a sociology for it. Orientalism focused specifically on those societies that were not quote-unquote primitive, that revealed elements of development, but were not uh, forms of development akin to the industrial forms of modern capitalism that were operative in Europe at that point in time. What you have, then, is a clear colonial heritage within the disciplinary framework. Right? Uh, so that history, which is the other very important social science, focuses, at least historically, has focused primarily on Europe, because these are the people with a developed society who have a real history. But anthropology focuses on the savages, and Orientalism on those other you know, developed societies that haven't gotten to the point, at least presumably, of capitalist societies. I say all of this again uh, very quickly, and again, I'd be happy to go into further details about this, because one of the other important methodological contributions of the Marxist tradition has been to foreground historical materialism as an antidote against the liberal and colonial ideologies that saturate the bourgeois social sciences to such an extent that they structure them fundamentally. Because what historical materialism does is it takes as its starting point an analysis of the social totality in which Economics and politics and society are all bound up together, and the colonial relationship between the imperial core and the periphery is a result of an evolving global system of capitalism. And so you need to analyze the world from the point of view of the social totality and not uh, take as your starting point the liberal and colonial ideology that I just mentioned. In that regard, Historical materialism developed, and I think this is very important, as a science, but not as a bourgeois natural science or a bourgeois social science. It developed as a collective, fallibilistic science of the totality of the natural and social world. Science is often a word that when people hear it, they withdraw in horror and say, well, we can't analyze society like we could you know, analyze the functioning of an atom or various chemical properties and things like this. And of course, for different objects of analysis, you can have different levels of precision and different forms of predictability. And that's the case, for that matter, across different social sciences. But in the case of historical and dialectical materialism, this is not a dogmatic science that says that we have a blueprint regarding the way in which everything in the world functions. It is fallibilistic in the sense that it puts forth the most powerful explanatory model possible while constantly testing it in relationship to extant reality. In that regard, there isn't a dominant and static model. There is the need, and here we're getting close to Rodney, for a constant concrete analysis of concrete situations. And since concrete situations change, you constantly have to change your apprehension of them and resituate your understanding of them in relationship to this broader social totality. Another very important aspect of this tradition, then, is that truth is not somehow dependent upon metaphysical forces or a map of the world that would be perfect for all time. Truth and the epistemology of historical and dialectical materialism is dependent upon practice. Something is true because its explanatory power gives us the ability to intercede in the world and change it in such a way that it confirms the theoretical framework. And so a very important aspect of dialectical and historical materialism is not only its explanatory power, but its transformative power. And we'll talk more about this, I think, in the coming weeks. But transitioning into uh, another theme, one of the reasons that uh, historical and dialectical materialism have been, to say the least, marginalized, if not in many instances excluded from the capitalist modes of knowledge production, is because they're dangerous. And they're dangerous because they develop tools 
for an analysis of the totality that has a real purchase on the practical world because the orientation of this science isn't knowledge for knowledge's sake. The orientation is toward human and, for that matter, broader uh, emancipation that includes uh, the establishment of a sustainable ecological environment. In that regard, it should not be surprising that within the capitalist academy, there has been a veritable intellectual world war waged on dialectical and historical materialism in the name of shoring up bourgeois natural science, bourgeois social science, and the bourgeois humanities, which largely function as the repository for superstition, for the kind of je ne sais quoi that is irreducible to social scientific analysis or natural scientific analysis, because it's something that can't be fully explained, and therefore we need people who are experts in the unexplainable, uh, if it be the poetic, or the literary, or the philosophic, or the artistic. In many ways, these are stand-ins for a bourgeois ideology that's trying to carve out space for the maintenance of various forms of superstitious thought. Which is not to say that we can explain everything and that there aren't things that are kind of beyond the reach of human comprehension, but it does mean that there are clear bulwarks in place that have been established within the capitalist world in order to keep people from understanding the social totality. And one of the ways in which that has been done is appeals to the, the je ne sais quoi, which in, is helpful in French, it means that I don't know what, but it means that kind of special something that everybody recognizes who's on the in crowd, but nobody can really explain. So we can organize these kind of ritualistic dances around it that are very beneficial to people with certain types of careers, but don't actually explain concrete things like how literature has functioned as a material practice historically, or philosophy or other discourses in that regard. In this sense, I'd like to transition into some of the uh, Rodney, at least very quickly. One of the very important points I think that Rodney makes in this essay and in his other work is that Marxism is a method. It's not a dogma. It's a method that continues to develop and change based on, as I was saying earlier, concrete analyses of concrete situations. And so what that means is that the onus is on those doing the analysis to marshal the tools and methods operative within a particular tradition in order to develop new concrete analysis. Right? So it's actually a tradition that's constantly growing and constantly transforming. The denigration, I should say, moreover, of Marxism as a dogma is a very specific product of the forms of knowledge production that I was just referencing and the way in which the bourgeois cultural apparatus tends to operate. Rodney's work on this front is top-notch. I strongly recommend his book on uh, the Russian... Uh, the uh, well, his book on the Russian Revolution and his book on how Europe underdeveloped Africa. I mean, all of his work is, is magisterial, in my opinion. One of the things that he points out is that if you're interested in the history of actually existing socialism, and you want to learn something about a country like the Soviet Union, which was the first established socialist state, and you do that within the capitalist university, the first work that you're going to come across is work that has not only been developed by people who have been ideologically trained within that apparatus, but it's actually going to be work that has been specifically developed, promoted, distributed by the most nefarious forces of the bourgeois state. Rodney points in particular to the Hoover Institute, to the Columbia's uh, Russian Institute, and to uh, the Russian Institute at Harvard, all of which, it is very well documented, are products of the Central Intelligence Agency, which work hand in glove with these institutions to set up the type of Sovientology that was absolutely necessary for guaranteeing particular historical narratives. I would encourage all of you, and I have a long bibliography if anyone wants to read some of this work, to look into the Information Research Department, known as the IRD, 
that was established in 1948 by the Labour government in Great Britain as part of the Foreign Office. It was financed by the Secret Intelligence Service budget and had close links to MI6, which is the uh, kind of CIA equivalent in Great Britain, and to the Central Intelligence Agency. The role of the IRD, like the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a later CIA front, was to establish an international anti-communist propaganda network that was extremely far-reaching. Newspapers, magazines, news agencies, publishing houses, academic institutions, radio stations, and much more. It was in constant contact, and this is all part of the public record, by the way, including uh, direct first-person testimony on the part of the IRD agents involved. Constant contact with the BBC worked directly with such significant bourgeois uh, outlets as London Press Service and Reuters. The IRD also placed its people in the media and in the academic world. Hugh Wilford, who has written poignantly on this, claimed that by 1950, the IRD had succeeded in establishing permanent channels for the routine transmission of its by now considerable output of anti-communist propaganda all over the world. George Orwell, if you're familiar with his famous communist uh, list, uh, snitched to the IRD and gave them a list of suspected communists so that they could then uh, run propaganda campaigns against the research of these communists. Other intellectuals involved included the likes of Bertrand Russell, Arthur Kostler, Miloš from uh, Czechoslovakia, Kravchenko, and hundreds, potentially thousands of others. Uh, if you look at Robert Conquest's book, one of the most famous books on the history of the Soviet Union called The Great Terror, Stalin's Purge of the 30s, it drew directly and extensively on IRD files, meaning that its research was pure state propaganda from Great Britain. David Barzillay similarly presented the IRD's propaganda material in his historical writings as if it was his own. Oxford historian A.J.P. Taylor and Leonard Shapiro, a professor at the London School of Economics, both had IRD ties, and the latter was a member of its inner circle. Brian Crozier, one of the very first people you come across if you're looking for research on this, this specific history, was a well-known, uh, uh, was actually on the central staff of the IRD. So I say all of this, and I could say a lot more about it, to demonstrate Rodney's point that if you're interested in understanding certain aspects of material reality, you have to take seriously the extent to which there are objective forces that control the material production of knowledge that mean that most people, when they do a search online or they go into a library and they reach for the book, you're almost certainly going to come across a product of bourgeois ideology, if not a product of propaganda campaigns of this sort or spin-offs from them. Uh, Rodney actually in an interview had a great line where a student had asked him, well, how do I know the difference between like bourgeois and Marxist uh, theory? And he said, well, just go into any library and choose any book. That is bourgeois ideology. And obviously, I mean, he's overstating his case a little bit, but what he wanted to demonstrate is that the institutional power is so awesome that if you're not aware of it, you're going to simply be swimming downstream. The, uh, a few other things on Rodney, and then I want to pass it back to Jennifer to bring in some of the Lesordo. So the bourgeois cultural apparatus has promoted forms of Marxism due to the fact that Marxism relates to very real struggles, and there is a need and interest in Marxism on the part of the working and oppressed masses of the world. So the bourgeois cultural apparatus has to deal with that fact. They can't get around it. The way they've tried to deal with it, though, is to transform Marxism into a form that is palatable and part of what the Central Intelligence, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency refers, refers to as the respectable or the compatible left. There are many ways in which they've done this. I'll just highlight a few very quickly. One is gutting Marxism of its revolutionary core. So Marxism just becomes a discourse amongst others. You can mix it with some Lacanianism or some other things because it's just one point of view, and it's not actually uh, something that's linked to people's struggles concretely. Secondly, there's a very strong tendency to sever historical materialism from dialectical materialism, abandoning the latter as somehow metaphysical and unnecessary, so that all of Marxism becomes only focused on the social world, and moreover, there's a tendency 
to focus only on the cultural world. And so the term cultural Marxism, that's often used to refer to people like uh, the thinkers within the Frankfurt School and many members of what's called Western Marxism, is actually uh, an attempt to condense the entire Marxist tradition into a tiny segment of the breadth of the Marxist tradition that deals with dialectical and historical materials. Most importantly, it has promoted forms of Marxism that are directly opposed to actually existing socialism and are explicitly and resolutely anti-communist. And so the phenomenon of Western Marxism, which Jennifer's going to unpack a little bit through the work of Lesordo, is extremely important to understand that, meaning that if you're trained primarily within the Western world and through the kind of imperial institutions that are the dominant ones, if you've been exposed to Marxism, most likely you've been exposed to this form of Marxism. And that's a product of the objective material forces of the history of imperialism that you cannot see if you simply take it kind of at face value or spontaneously or organically. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer for a broader discussion of Lesordo. And I think we probably have 15, 20 more minutes, maybe a little bit more than that, and then we're going to open it up, so, yeah. yeah. So, um, Gabriel and I have been um, working on the work of Domenico Lesordo, who is a, was a historian and philosopher, um, born in 1941, who was actually a previous speaker in the Critical Theory Workshop. Um, we are, we just finished recently an introduction um, for the English translation of his book, Western Marxism, that's going to be published by Monthly Review. And we've also, we're also writing um, another article on his work. And I, I want to say that um, I think one of the things that we have both found I mean, it, so compelling about his work, or one of the reasons why we both found it so compelling, because it has, I think, inspired in both of us a kind of profound self-critique yeah. of our own work. That's certainly the case for me. Definitely. And a reflection on the kind of enormous blind spots that I think we both had in our work, including in our you know, work within Marxism. 100%. Um, so just briefly, you know, Lesordo was a lifelong communist militant. And it's also important to know that his political and intellectual practice were, um, were both really shaped by his close collaboration with the German uh, scholar Edmurthe Ed, Ed Brillmeier. Uh, she was also actively engaged in Communist Party politics and um, notably visited China uh, as part of a poly party delegation. So in this book, um, Western Marxism, Lesordo um, diagnoses some of the overarching tendencies of what he refers to as Western Marxism. These include a uh, tendency towards idealism, giving a primacy to theory divorced from practice, a kind of Eurocentric social chauvinism, in the sense of an attitude of a kind of patronizing cultural superiority. Um, also, the dogmatic rejection of actually existing socialism. A politics of defeat that is often based on historical misrepresentations. And a willful dilution of Marxism with bourgeois theory and petty bourgeois theoretical practices. A celebration of marketable novelty at the expense of practical relevance and a perpetuation of cultural imperialism and disdain for actual popular struggles in the global south. Now, for Lesordo, um, I wanted to explain this term, Western <coughs> Marxism. So, he uses the term of Eastern Marxism to identify those who have actually exercised power, as in the case of the USSR, Vietnam, Korea, China, Cuba, and so forth. But the Western, Western Marxism, by contrast, names intellectuals who generally have opposed these efforts to construct socialism, rejecting the quest for power in favor of diverse forms of critical theory, while sometimes presenting their distance from power as an epistemological advantage for discovering so-called authentic Marxism. So for the sort of Eastern and Western Marxism, our Marxism are not geographical terms, but rather they're referring to these two different political orientations both of which have manifested themselves across the globe. One of them is dedicated to the difficult and drawn out process of building socialism in a capitalist dominated world, and in particular in the global south, which has been the principal site for these endeavors thus far. The other, Western Marxism, is generally dismissive of these kinds of practical undertakings, 
often belittling concrete struggles against imperialism because they do not live up to an imagined standard of theoretical or moral purity. So I also want to be clear that Lasorda is diagnosing a historical phenomenon that extends beyond the work of self-declared Marxists. He focuses um, in this book on philosophical currents coming out of the Frankfurt School and French theory, um, as well as some work that is in dialogue with them. And while these traditions often draw on Marxism, sometimes covering their tracks when they do that, they also tend to treat it as one discourse among, amongst others, which they freely combine in idealist fashion with bourgeois or even aristocratic theories of various sorts. And so this has led some thinkers who are associated with Marxism to take positions that are actually explicitly anti-Marxist. So what the Western Marxists share in common is their promotion by the US-driven global theory industry as the most radical theory on offer. That is, their international influence is the product of cultural imperialism. And as we'll discuss, their work often perpetuates this cultural imperialism. I also want to note that what Lasorda diagnoses also applies to very explicitly anti-Marxist <coughs> theoretical trends that we'll discuss in the coming days, such as post-colonial theory, decolonial theory, and Afro-pessimism. So Lasorda's critique of Western Marxism is neither an imminent critique nor an ad hominem attack that's aimed to just lambast individual thinkers. On the contrary, he elucidates the objective social forces that have produced Western Marxism as a remarkably consistent ideology in imperialist countries, as well as in class strata in the periphery that inspire to kind of the rewards of imperialism. So his use of geographic terminology, of course, does not imply that all Marxists in a particular region necessarily suffer from the same ideology, as that would be quite reductivist. And his work eschews these kinds of mechanical explanations in favor of a nuanced account of the dialectical play of forces between subjective and objective forces. After all, Lucerto himself was a Marxist living and working in the imperial core, but rather than allowing himself to be determined by the, these objective forces of his existence as a professional intellectual in the West, he engaged in self-critical examination of the conditions of possibility of his intellectual production. And this was surely facilitated by the fact that he was in constant dialogue with solid political parties and the global communist movement. His work is therefore, therefore a testament to the fact that subjective freedom is not enhanced by ignoring the objective forces that determine our thoughts and actions, but rather precisely by recognizing the depths to which our worldviews have been conditioned by social determinants. This form of objective ideology critique meaning a criticism of the objective de determinations of our individual ideology that are rooted in the economic base and global class struggle is precisely what his work demands of us. Now, Lucerto draws extensively on Lenin's resounding diagnosis and lapidary indictment of social chauvinism and racism in the socialist movement within imperialist states. Many of Lenin's searing critiques of revisionism meaning the gutting of Marxism's revolutionary core, center on a condemnation of the social chauvinism that plagued European members of the Second International. The Bolshevik leader criticized as opportunists those who supported World War I, lining up on the imperial agendas of their national bourgeoisies against the interests of the global working class. Lenin not only critiqued social chauvinism among European workers, he also identified its material basis in the imperialist world system. In his famous 1916 essay on imperialism, which set much of the political agenda for the Third International, he argued that the imperialist extraction of monopolist super profits from peripheral societies had created a labor aristocracy among the European working class, resulting in their embouchement that is, their identification with the interests of their own national bourgeoisies over and against those of their fellow proletarians in other countries. So Lenin's foundational elucidation of imperialism's tendency to exacerbate uneven development and the stratification of the global proletariat, as well as his insistence on the right of nations to self-determination, have served as a basis for countless subsequent analyses that seek to identify the material foundations of racism and chauvinism. It should be noted, moreover, that this theoriz his theorization of dependency, super-exploitation, 
and the regional differentiation of labor has also been widely used to analyze relations and specifically racialized social and labor hierarchies that also obtain within single nation states, including what has been subsequently identified as internal colonialism. So Lesordo demonstrates how many Western Marxist social chauvinism expresses itself in paternalistic attitudes mm -hmm. towards the efforts of workers and peasants in the peripheries to struggle against imperialism. Like Lenin, he situates this condescending mindset as a legacy of the Second International, whose material basis is found in the socioeconomic relations of the world system. Those who enjoy the wages of imperialism are more likely to have disdain for or disinterest in the complex struggles for national liberation in the periphery, which is dismissed as the, quote, savage bar barbarism of the East in the choice words of Max Horkheimer that equally represented the views of Theodore Adorno. Now, the social chauvinistic attitude has become so foundational to Western Marxism that theorists in this tradition often behave as if there were no need to actually study the history of socialist states in any serious manner. In fact, the attempt, the attempt to do so is often looked upon with suspicion as a sign that one, may, one might be a bore rather than a professional intellectual with, with a keen sense of what is worthy of scholarly inquiry. Michel Foucault is a case in point since he rejected what he referred to as the, quote, totalizing approach of Marxism in favor of occupying the position of a specific intellectual who only addresses topics within his or her own areas of expertise. Yet Foucault had no qualms pontificating about the death of socialism, even though he had little to no knowledge of its international history. According to, uh, to Foucault, who was supposedly opposed to totalizing narratives, quote, Everything that this socialist tradition has produced in history is to be condemned. Now, the colonial geography underlying such pronouncement could not be clearer, and it is found in the work of many other Western intellectuals. That is, while the history of Western Europe is treated as infinitely complex, requiring expert knowledge, the class struggles of workers and peasants in the, in the periphery can be dismissed out of hand and is misguided without actually even studying them. So many Western Marxists have therefore come to embrace a form of critical theory that is skepti skeptical of all forms of power and domination, while simultaneously celebrating the moral excellence of those who are oppressed and bereft of power. Lacerdo refers to this tendency as populism, and he identifies it as one of the major leitmotifs in Western Marxism. And I want to note that this particular facet of Lacerdo's uh, diagnosis has particularly for me to a self-critique of my own earlier work, which was in some ways inspired by kind of autonomist Marxist discourses that are actually very deeply inflected with anarchist assumptions. Mea culpa, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so this, is, this um, populism is regularly evidenced by intellectuals expressed sympathy for and interest in the oppressed, accompanied by a denigration of any efforts to gain real power and in particular control of the state. Hart and Negri are one very well-known example of this. And we should note that there is, of course, a trenchant irony in taking the side of the oppressed only as long as they are losing. Lacerdo surely, surely recalls that this is the same position that Hegel criticized in Christians, who, in order to accomplish their obligation to serve the poor, needed the institution of poverty to persist indefinitely. Those intellectuals Lucerto refers as populists are generally skeptical of, if not opposed to, political parties, as well as the exercise of state power. For them, getting organized through the party form, like seeking to take over the state apparatus, inexorably leads to new forms of oppression that besmirch the moral excellence of the downtrodden. This is one of the reasons why rebellionism is another leitmotif in Western Marxism that is celebrating insurgency and revolt for their own sake, often devoid of context or concrete political content. And in doing so, many Western Marxists is, exalt the figure of the rebel, whom they present as anti-dogmatic, radically free, and morally superior to so-called authoritarian <laughs> state-centric socialists, or so-called party intellectuals. Yet, <clears throat> this libertarian orientation which segues in key ways with liberal ideology, um, only amounts to what Lacerdo calls a dogmatism of the subject, that is, a thoughtless embrace of the figure in revolt, 
which is an obvious production of Western Marxist's own self-image, quoi petit bourgeois enfant terrible, or bad boys. So drawing on its important insights from Gramsci, Lacerdo explains that this kind of rebellionism can lend itself to distinct and even opposed political projects. And it is therefore a mistake to automatically associate with it with an, emancip an emancipatory politics. The deep history of dissident politics clearly demonstrates this point, since right-wing and sometimes even philo-fascist dissidents promoted by imperialist governmental agencies like the CIA were and are rebels opposed to states, but specifically socialist states. We might think of, for example, the celebration by Western intellectuals of Cuban dissidents or anti-communist movements in Hong Kong. So it is a historical irony that many Western Marxists who are nominally committed to building a world beyond capitalism nonetheless tacitly accept mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher's famous dictum that there is no alternative to capitalism. Desiring an alternative to capitalism while actually regularly denigrating historical efforts to construct socialism has in, fact, has in effect produced a version of this neoliberal ideology within <coughs> Western Marxism and Western critical theory more broadly. It essentially asserts that the only alternatives to capitalism exist as an unrealized potential which happens to only cohere in the ideas of professional intellectuals but certainly not in the practice of people in socialist societies, unless in extreme cases they are consigned to the past or remain highly marginalized and completely devoid of state power. This kind of idealist anti-capitalism, which is hegemonic in the, West, in the West's progressive intelligentsia, acquiesces to Western imperialism's triumphant claims about the, ends of the end of socialism. It also often accepts the ruse that imperialism no longer structures structures political and economic relations around the world. And again, here Hart and Negri's empire is one very infamous example of such an account. And these two tendencies go hand in hand, as the dismissal of imperialism undergirds the denigration of socialist states' efforts to struggle against it, including and especially via their efforts to develop peacefully without being turned back into colonies or semi-colonies of imperialist powers. In fact, Lacerdo points out that the confluence between idealist anti-capitalism and support for U.S. imperialism is readily, readily evidenced in the words of famous Western Marxists like Max Horkheimer and Michael Hart, as the former defended the U.S. imperialist warfare in Vietnam and the latter defended NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia. And we could add Zizek to that, who of course is a supporter of the, uh, the NATO intervention in Ukraine. Those Western Marxists who do not appear to propose um, some, excuse me, those Western Marxists who do appear to propose some kind of alternative to the extant order often traffic in magical thinking and a belief in the most suspect forms of idealist utopian salvation. The sort of details, in fact, how this Marxism has grafted itself onto religious ideologies deeply rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And he is very attentive to the ways that the Judeo-Christian tradition has deeply shaped Western political culture. It should therefore not be surprising that messianism is another leitmotif of Western Marxism. Although the precise forms that it takes vary considerably, there is a general tendency to project a vision of the future as totally other than what currently exists. Such a future cannot therefore be arrived at through the telluric path of extant institutions, including the rule of law, parliaments, parties, states, and so forth. Rather, all these things and much more need to be promptly abolished. In this kind of utopian thinking, the new world that is aspired to is totally other and therefore must break with everything and arrive on the scene more or less mirac miraculously. By contrast, Marx and Engels understood that socialism is not created out of nothing, nor is it simply the desideratum of individuals. Yeah. And I'll go and turn it over to Dave to talk a bit more about the dialectics of socialism. Yeah, in that regard, one of the things that's very powerful in Lasordo's work, but also in Rodney's for that matter, is that socialism doesn't fall from the sky, it's not an idea that somebody has, there's no blueprint. It is, it emerges dialectically out of the capitalist system. In that regard, the task of building socialism is the task of transforming a kind of totalizing system of capitalism, and we should not then expect 
socialism to just arrive in its perfect form as if out of nowhere or as if it were an idea that popped out of the head of Zeus. On the contrary, if we're actual materialists, we should expect socialism to develop having inherited all of the ills of capitalism, all of the ways in which there are social hierarchies that are racialized, that are gendered, um, as well as various forms of social degradation and the fact that every socialist state building project has been in the colonial and imperial uh, periphery, therefore it's been subjected to decades, if not centuries, of capitalist underdevelopment. That's what socialist projects inherit. In that regard, socialist pro uh, projects need to develop their productive forces as quickly as possible in order to fend off the imperial powers, but they have to do it without relying on the mechanisms that are the principal mechanisms for the generation of profits under capitalism, which are colonialism and various forms of racialized super-exploitation. So in certain ways, socialism has to do the impossible. In that regard, if we're materialists and we actually want to analyze how the world works, it is absolutely absurd to go down the path, and I admit that I've gone down that path, and you can look it up, and it's in some of my writings, and very uh, embarrassed in that regard, but I think it's better to be embarrassed and self-critical than to be wrong. And uh, in, in that regard, Lesordo's work and some of the other work that our current scholarship is drawing on foregrounds not only the fact that there's a dialectics of socialism, that means that it's a process that takes time and that that process also is necessarily structured by certain fundamental contradictions. Because if the strategy is to exit imperialism and build a socialist world, in order to do that, you sometimes have to retreat from the strategy and your tactics can contradict that strategy. Right? In Marxist terminology, of course, the strategy is the ultimate goal. The tactics are the small steps that one takes in order to get there. Uh, a very good example of this, and I'm sure we'll return to it later, is China's environmental policy. Many people love to say, well, look at China in the 90s, it was horrific. And yes, there was a horrible ecological footprint on the part of China due to the reform and opening up and the introduction of certain capitalist modes of uh, production within capitalism, or I'm sorry, within the, the socialist state building project, but also due to the fact that there was an effort to build the productive forces as quickly as possible. What's going on now in China clearly demonstrates, since they're the leader in global uh, wind and solar energy, that that was a tactic that did contradict the strategy. And now the productive forces have developed to the point where they can resolve that contradiction. And so a lot of Western Marxists look at socialism through the lens of absolute purity. And they'll withdraw in horror as soon as there is a tactic that might contradict the strategy and they don't understand the broader logic of the dialectics of socialism. One of the other things that I think is very important that I'll highlight very uh, quickly is that against all odds, one of the extraordinary things about the history of socialist state building projects is their resounding success at certain fundamental levels. There is an excellent study that was done in 1986 that I'd be more than happy to share with you that looked at the largest body of data at that point in time, which is World Bank data, and it compared socialist to capitalist countries in order to analyze the physical quality of life index in countries that were at similar levels of development, right? So they distinguish between high levels of development and low levels of development. The physical quality of life index is a composite index calculated from life expectancy, infant mortality rate, and literacy rate, all of which reflect broader patterns within society. What the report found was that in socialist uh, uh, countries, they had a more favorable performance in 22 of 24 of their compar comparisons in the largest body of data at that point in time. Remarkable study, and one of the things that it demonstrates is the dialectics of socialism is not an attempt to then accept the kind of failings of socialism and justify them in the name of some type of utopian ideal that would be in the future. It's to actually look at the material record and highlight the real substantive gains for the working masses of the world. Returning then to the, the work of Lesordo, and here we're getting close to wrapping up our, uh, our presentation, it's true that the, the capitalist ruling class has a very vested interest in policing the kind of limits of acceptable discourse so that most people aren't familiar with the study that I just referenced, or for that matter, most people don't uh, have, I think, at least within the Western world and the way through which they've been trained, a nuanced understanding of the dialectics of socialism. Uh, 
the, one of the things that Lesordo then points out is that the, the discourses that tend to be promoted within the bourgeois cultural apparatus are discourses that invisibilize these substantive gains on the part of socialist state building projects and also do not give people the understanding that they need to have regarding the deep history of imperialism. Uh, I'll also highlight in this regard, I mean, this, this refers back to a little of what I highlighted earlier, but uh, part of the work that Lesordo has done also points to the central role that Western intelligence agencies have played in a lot of the propaganda war against actually existing socialism. And a very important element of this that relates to the kind of utopian thinking of the Western intelligentsia is the fact that the Central Intelligence Agency, and this is a quote from one of their leading agents who oversaw propaganda campaigns in Europe in the early years of the Cold War. Uh, this is Thomas Braden. He says, in much of Europe in the 1950s, socialists, people who call themselves left, were the only people who gave a damn about fighting communism. So there was an attempt, very clearly spelled out, to actually fund and support not simply the right wing or the liberals, but the anti-communist left, what the CIA refers to as the compatible left, and to shore up the power of the kind of social democratic anti-communist left over and against the tradition of the kind of third international, which included an organization that I just mentioned a moment ago, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, that had you know, offices in 35 countries and ran some of the prestige magazines. Uh, it had 50 prestigious journals that it ran around the world in multiple different languages. It uh, sponsored 135 international conferences, published at least 170 books. It also ran a press service that reached some five million people. So these were extremely expansive propaganda endeavors. In 1975, in fact, the Church Committee released a detailed depart, uh, report on the U.S. intelligence community and its abuses, and it found that the agency uh, admitted, the CIA, that is, to being in contact with, quote, many thousands of academics in hundreds of institutions. And those contacts, again, were not simply in order to shore up a kind of liberal or right-wing intelligentsia, but also precisely the forms of utopian, anti-communist, quote-unquote, cultural Marxism that we were just talking about a moment ago. It is here that I think the opportunism of the Western Marxists uh, comes into full light, and this must be understood via an analysis of class interest. They are the professional in intellectuals ensconced in elite networks in the global north, and they're part of what some call the new petty bourgeoisie, meaning the professional managerial class stratum in the imperial core. Afraid, from afraid of proletarianization from below and attracted to the bourgeoisie above, while often being resentful of its overlords but devoid of a long-term collective political project, the new petty bourgeoisie sometimes celebrates jacqueries, or you know, revolts, and supports greater access to power for its social group. However, it does not generally seek concrete system change because, in the words of Poulancis, it does not want to break the ladders by which it imagines it can climb." End quote. It is here that it becomes clear that many of the Western Marxists within this class stratum occupy the position of radical recuperators, presenting themselves, and here I'm thinking of Hart and Negri and Agamben and Zizek and Adorno and Horkheimer and many, many others, and I'd be happy to go into any of the details because one of my current book projects focuses on this quite specifically. Uh, these radical recuperators present themselves as representing the interests of the oppressed, but they're devoid of any practical program for system change, and they therefore ultimately seek to recuperate potentially transformative forces within the capitalist order by guiding the masses towards symbolic and discursive solutions, such as consumerism within the confines of the theory industry. This false solution to very real problems has the added benefit of bolstering the social standing of the petty bourgeois producers of these intellectual consumer goods. So, Jen, I don't know if you want to say a few more words or if this is a time to open up. It's your call. 
I can, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just say a few words up. and yeah. wrap it up. Um, I just wanted to note that um, while we focused on Lasordo's critique of Western theory, there is, you know, his impressive corpus goes well beyond critique to offer an invaluable analysis of class struggle in the 20th century. And as you saw from the interview that you read, this account centers the struggle between imperialism and anti-colonialism. In other works, he offers a very clear-eyed account of neoliberalism as an imperialist and specifically neocolonial neo counter-revolution that has not only rolled back gains made by the global working class, but that has specifically countered the efforts of colonized and formerly colonized people to resist imperialist subordination. Now, he also argues that for independent nation states that have historically been subject to colonial, semi-colonial, or neocolonial domination, the struggle for national liberation has passed from a political military phase to a political economic phase, wherein the development of productive forces is of paramount importance. And development is needed in these, if these countries are to maintain independence and avoid being subordinated to imperialist powers through relations of economic dependency. It is also required to meet the needs of people who have been subject to great privation owing to the conditions that underdevelopment, underdevelopment imposed on them. I found this account a really excellent antidote to some of the anti-developmentalist thinking that is quite popular right now in certain circles, I mean, especially in Latin American studies and decolonial studies. Um, I'll be speaking about some of that next week. And I also think this account is going to be really helpful for some of the things we're talking about this week, on, um, specifically on China as well. So Great. I think with that, we'll go ahead and um, end and open it up to conversation. <laughs> There's a lot of us here, so we can just raise hands if you're online, you can use the raise hand function. And since there's a lot of people, maybe we could take three or four questions and we'll condense them and figure out who's going to respond. So the floor is open. I actually see a hand online. I can't see anybody over here, so you have to stand up and wave. If you and, and Nico? Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and start with the person online and Nico, and, and then we'll take it from there. Go ahead, um, Sabrina. Hi, um, it's so great to see you again this year. Um, I just had a question, it's kind of like a, a personal question because I come from literature, like I study English literature as a PhD student. And, um, you know, for me, education is very important to doing some of these analyses that you're bringing up and bringing students kind of into the fold of some of this um, history that you're, you're talking about that they have no idea about. But still within the confines of this bourgeois institution can be kind of difficult to do when they don't have other professors that support that kind of analysis. So my, I guess I was thinking about teaching uh, a figure like Richard Wright, um, who, you know, kind of goes between being a communist and anti-communist in the course of his life. And um, it's also part of this global theory industry, even as a fiction writer. But you can see in some of his writing a kind of proletarian thrust, which uh, also kind of sometimes hides his communism and brings uh, forward a kind of anti-communism. So I guess I was just going to ask the question of like, how do you kind of teach these kinds of figures that you know you want as a form of explaining these complicated concepts, right? Like fiction is a really good way to do that because it's very accessible to students. Um, but then also, it feels like if you come out as an academic, um, as a, a Marxist, that you could get black, blacklisted for teaching an overtly Marxist theory. So I guess I was just kind of, kind of going between these two things of like practically being an academic who is teaching Marxist theory and trying to teach Marxist writers while also do, kind of empathizing with someone like Richard Wright and this like kind of hiddenness and being strategic in the academy with your Marxism. So I don't know if that makes sense as a question. I know it's kind of a big thought, but I'm curious to hear what you think. Great question. Nico, you want to go too? Does this work? Yes. I think so. Um, I have I have sort of an idea of the answer, and I've thought about this one a bit, um, and I get asked this question a lot. Um, but you guys kind of oppose it, it, 
on one hand, just the sort of decolonial theory, and, and what you've written, the sort of uh, epistemic version of that to, to anti colonialism, right, which is saying not right. So I just want to ask how would you guys sort of define and, and the sort of opposition between those two things? Um, the, maybe there's a sort of a relationship there that could be a little more specific, a certain dialectical development. But I, I definitely sense there's a certain tension there, and um, I'm always thinking about this. So I just wanted to hear um, how you two describe it. Thank you very much. Great. Is there a third question we should get on the table, or people still? Yeah, Juan. If you could just, yeah, turn it. The, the, it's just that way people online can hear. But don't pull it too far, or you'll pull all of them off. Good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to read the book that both of you are going to publish. And I was wondering how to overcome the Marxist uh, traditional concept of ideology as a distortion that encloses social contradictions, because it seems that there's a positive concept of ideology in the case of Walter Rodney and in the talk that the two of you gave. But one can also see that the traditional Marxist concept of ideology could, could also be used to explain where Western Mar Marxism is in the sense that they are using the means, the intellectual means of production, and they are destined to produce a bourgeois ideology. So yeah, what's the concept of ideology that you have? Okay. I'm happy to talk about Richard Wright if you want. Okay, Because uh, Richard Wright's a, a fascinating uh, person and, and, and writer, in part because of the complex position that he occupied within a larger play of forces that had to do with the attempt on the part of U.S. intelligence agencies to co-opt, control, and ultimately steer the black radical movement and, and black literature even more specifically. And so Wright, uh, as, as you pointed out, Sabrina, took different positions and tended to vary quite considerably, both kind of politically and his social views, so I think he's a kind of a fascinating character. There are also a lot of questions about his death and about various roles that, that uh, certain agencies might have played in it, uh, as well as the fact that he was part of the, a larger kind of expat community. And so I think he's a, a fascinating figure in that regard. I also think that the use of fiction as a modality of education is extremely important, and it reminds me of the quintessential contribution of someone like Bertolt Brecht, who talked quite, I think, poignantly about the importance of form. And he had an expansive understanding of form. Form is the way in which you communicate thoughts, affects, perceptions to other people. And that form can be discourse, it can be dance, it can be music, it can be fiction. There are many, many different ways of doing that. And one of the strengths of Brecht's analysis is, a, again, a kind of Marxist primacy of practice that it's always situational and it depends on its ability to actually reach people in a way that other avenues couldn't, right? So a lot of the work that we've been doing on art, even though we were critical of the kind of bourgeois concept and practice of art, is an interest in form being able to connect with people in ways that me lecturing them certainly doesn't. Uh, because it brings people in, it gets them excited, it connects them to other people, or it transforms the very horizons of their existence. And so that is just one thought that was uh, provoked by what you said. The last thing is the relationship between Marxism and academies is a very fraught because there wasn't a red scare. There's an ongoing red scare and a series of red purges. And so one has to figure out various tactics for navigating that. And a lot of it depends on how you're situated in the academy, which academy we're talking about. But one of the things that I think can be very helpful, and some people are real experts at that, is the kind of Trojan horse tactic. And you also see that in art and culture. One of the beauties of a Trojan horse tactic is that you can construct something that from the outside looks like an art object and is an offering to the extant system, meaning the dominant cultural apparatus. But in fact, it's a war machine because inside there are all of these forces that could potentially destabilize the the bourgeois cultural apparatus. So there are a number of people, one of whom we're going to invite to the workshop next year, who have, has had a fascinating academic career, who uh, you wouldn't know is a Marxist or is a revolutionary, be, but the work that's there is such that the Trojan horse is visible to people who read it. 
If people are familiar with the work of Michael Parenti, for instance, he very rarely would say things like, I'm a Marxist. I mean, in certain works, in certain lectures, for the most part, he just did really solid analysis. And he demonstrated fundamental things that anybody who's a Marxist who would read it would be like, yeah, obviously the guy's a Marxist. Um, he did, that being said, never secure a stable academic position due to his anti-imperialist activism, so he might not be the best example, but I do think that the Trojan horse tactic is one that can work in many instances. Do you want to address the decolonial? Yeah, and I just wanted just to follow up on uh, Sabrina. I really appreciated the kind of question about the kind of the practicalities of, of teaching. I'm um, also teaching in an English department, so I think about these questions a lot, and I just wanted to add that I think that it can be you know, we can very useful to you know to just to openly identify and talk about the kind of contradictions that are in you know a work that that you're teaching, and to not to shy away from those. And also, it can be I think incredibly important to again situate the production of the work in class relations in order to, as we've been talking about, mm -hmm. identify some of the objective social forces that condition the kind of ideologies that that work expresses. Um, now, I, the question of decolonial and anti-colonial thought, I'm going to be talking about that um, at length next week, but so I wanted to just briefly, you know, I would, if we're talking about decolonial theory that is, you know, generally associated um, with the kind of Mignolo and company decolonial, decoloniality, um, coloniality, modernity, decoloniality group, um, which is, um, you know, which has really self-consciously, a group, you know, of intellectuals who have very self-consciously promoted themselves as a kind of vanguard of theorizing that has, a, you know, they, that has supposedly transcended the limits of anti-colonial and um, post-colonial thought. And they're, you know, quite explicitly, you know, situate themselves in that way. Um, and I would say, and I think one of the main precepts of this body of thought is that they, um, argue that it's epistemological characteristics mm -hmm. of the modern, of the West, that are the kind of driving force um, behind the perpetuation of characteristics of coloniality, is the term they use, um, in nominally, in, in, in um, independent, you know, nominally post-colonial states. Um, I would say, you know, this work is in my mind um, really built on a rejection of a lot of the really core precepts of anti-colonial thought and really specifically a um, uh, rejection of the history of anti-colonial struggle in the global south. Um, and, you know, and some of them kind of openly will say as much um, insofar as they are very openly dismissive of um, Marxism, which has been you know, has a complex but absolutely central role to the understanding of anti-colonial struggles globally. Um, and there's also the, you know, this very notion of, um, uh, well, I also, before I say that, it's also built on, you know, frankly, like a whole invisibilization of the entire analysis of neocolonialism that comes from the Marxist tradition that you won't really hear decolonial scholars even acknowledge that there have been, you know, decades and decades of people who have already been analyzing neocolonialism or have been analyzing why colonial relations are perpetuated in um, independent nation states. Um, instead, they're kind of trying to reinvent the wheel and saying everything is epistemological or ideological and that somehow by just thinking differently, that's going to be the solution to um, neocolonial um, to neocolonialism. So I think it's, you know, it is, I think it is a kind of reactionary development um, that has really exhibits a lot of the characteristics of what I was just talking about in regard to with Lacerda, with the kind of idealism, uh, utopianism, the messianism. And it also, and I would also say, I think it's important to note that a lot of those characteristics are also really used to shore up the figure of the decolonial theorist as this kind of mediating figure who is the only one who can somehow um, really gesture towards because this sort of um, other epistemology that they're constantly referencing but very rarely offer any kind of concrete details about. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I'm gonna, I'll get into a lot of this, uh, more of this next week.
Yeah, and I'll quickly address the question of ideology. I definitely used to have the pretension of developing like, my own concepts, like my own concept of ideology. Uh, when I think of my former self, I find it a little bit laughable because there's the deep and rich history of collective thought that has been articulating and developing accounts of ideology. And so I think a much more sober relationship to that is identifying the strengths of that project, in particular, the Marxist analysis of ideology as a camera obscura, right? That ideology takes the world and it turns it upside down, but it does it in such a way that you can't see it happening. So the camera obscura is akin to Marx's analysis of the commodity fetishism in the first volume of Capital when he describes how light hits the retina and the image on the retina is upside down, but it's spontaneously inverted by the brain, right? So it would be as if you're trying to look at the world and see your retinal image, meaning the world upside down. And you can't do it because that's how quickly ideology functions and how naturalized it's become. I think that's an extremely powerful analysis. In the work that Jennifer and I have been doing, which again, I think, needs some improvement because we're not fully satisfied with the essay that we wrote on the compositional model of ideology, it's drawing on that Marxist understanding of the camera obscura, but it's also simultaneously bringing to the fore the ways in which, particularly in the German ideology, Marx and Engels didn't just have an ideational or representational understanding of ideology. They say very explicitly that the, uh, our material senses have been formed by the history of the material world that we live in. So the things we see, how we perceive the world, is a consequence of ideology. And it's not just our perceptions, it's also our habits, our desires, our affects. And so we're trying to develop out of uh, and in conversation with this deeper Marxist tradition, a kind of multifaceted account of ideology that allows us to both understand ideology in certain instances as distortions a la the camera obscura, but also there are other ways in which ideology functions. And the last thing I'd say on that, because I think your point regarding Western Marxism is a good one, because you do see the camera obscura really clearly there. Because, right, Western Marxism is, you take Marxism in its kind of full-blown uh, aspects that you have in Marx and Engels and Lenin and other figures that we've referenced, which is dialectical and historical materialism, and a collective fallibilistic science, everything that I was saying earlier, and you transform it into a kind of analysis of consumer society that is openly hostile to actually existing socialism. So that's a very good example of a kind of distortion in which you turn the world upside down. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and we'll open up to other questions, comments, criticisms we always enjoy as well. Uh, I can't quite read your name. Felix. Felix, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, watch the domino effect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Felix. Uh, and first of all, I wanted to thank you for the uh, excellent talk, which I really enjoyed. Um, uh, there's one thing I wanted to ask about coming from uh, Berlin and being a Western Marxist uh, of sorts. So I want to sort of maybe play that role a little bit. Um, you talked about the dialectical um, evolution, or um, yeah of uh, real existing socialist uh, states and the possibility that sometimes the tactics uh, can seem to contradict strategy, but in fact, maybe in a, in a later step, the tactics readjust the strategy and stuff like this. So I, I uh, while in agreement with this, I still wonder if there is a sort of positive conceptual um, instrument that we have, or that you would say we have as a sort of materialist, to also conceptualize when the tactic doesn't just seem to uh, contradict the strategy, but when it actually does, and when it actually maybe uh, leads the project astray in a real sense, <clears throat> how we can uh, diagnose that and how we can criticize that in a way that is maybe um, you know constructive in a sense and not destructive, uh, because you know in the, in the history of real existing socialism there are a lot of instances where you could say that things might have gone wrong. Maybe there were just, you know, tactical flaws or something like this. Even in the early stages by, for example, people like Rosa Luxburg criticizing even the Soviet Union in the early stage before Stalin took over or for being not democratic enough and stuff like this. And like, 
coming back maybe as a last point to the, to the third interview that we read as preparation for this, uh, where he also adds the Russian state uh, to the sort of you know anti-imperialist um, bloc. So what does that you know make of our judgment of, uh, of the Ukraine war, for example? Is that you know simply a defense of the Russian state, a legitimate defense against uh, NATO imperialism? Is there a language maybe where we can criticize these things without abolishing anti-imperialism altogether? And is there a concept that's not just saying, well, historical materialism is fallible, but actually positive conceptual Great questions. Is there a third to throw oh, yeah. in the mix? Yeah. Well, that's a second, right? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, so the second I'll just read out loud from Mia oh, yeah. is, I've met a few people of the global majority who say Marxism is not for black people. What would you say to those who are racialized who say Marxism is a white theory? Um, and I think there's at least one other question here. There's another there as well. Okay, well, we'll take two, yeah, so we'll take two more. So go ahead and then we'll take the one. Yes, and my question was very similar to Felix, actually, because um, I read the Lusura um, interview, and I also thought it was really interesting that he referred to Russia as anti-colonialist, like current, uh, modern Russia. So um, I can see definitely how Russia could be seen as like against the hegemony, you know, um, Western hegemony that we see right now. But I was wondering if there's maybe a, a purpose in like differentiating between like uh, hegemony and like uh, capital, for example. Like uh, what's the use maybe of like terminology, you know, distinguishing between like uh, different forms of domination. Uh, yeah, maybe, do you want to take, we could do Emma and Marshall, and then we'll go to another round of questions after that. Yeah. There's someone asking if, if it can be repeated, because it was not into the mic. Uh, do you, oh, yeah, that. sorry, the mic wasn't on. Do you want to repeat it just really quickly, like a quick, sure. don't pull it too much. <laughs> uh, so I was just asking, uh, what's the use of uh, distinguishing different forms of elimination in terms of uh, terminology, because the interview we read uh, for this sort of here refers to Russia's uh, against uh, colonialism, and I was thinking maybe he uh, was talking more so about the Germany. Mm. Okay. And then, uh, Emin Marshall, do you want to go ahead and then we'll... Sure. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. So I just had a question about, <coughs> uh, more specifically about the readings in light of your talk, um, particularly comparing uh, what Walter Gottman <coughs> will call this like, particular burden of the third world Marxist to... Uh, as you say, like analyze the social totality, it's almost as if the third world Marxist has to kind of begin from scratch. And on 71 he writes, whereas in Western Europe, in North America, it is possible to plug into an existing body of thought for kind of Western Marxist, but as Jennifer was saying, um, as Lasordo um, points out, this Western Marxist uh, body, existing body of thought might be like corrupted at this point, um, or a particular anti-communist kind of Marxism. So I'm just wondering, you know, not to necessarily compare the burdens of the world's Marxists, but um, should we rethink Rodney's analysis of the ease with which the Western Marxists can kind of adopt an existing ideology uh, in light of this kind of corrupted Western Marxist that Lasorto was trying to point out? I mean, I think, I think that's a really <laughs> excellent point. And I do think that there's, um, and I would say, yes, I, I do think so. And I think that the kind of, you know, the, the um, uh, cultivation of this kind of compatible left that has, I think, you know, arguably taken on even greater dimensions um, as, you know, in the subsequent, in the decades subsequent to Rodney's writing, just because of the kind of strength of U.S. cultural imperialism um, over global knowledge production, I think does mean that um, it makes sense to have a very healthy kind of degree of suspicion in regard to the kind of work, um, the kind of, rep, you know, representatives works of Marxism that are promoted um, in the West. Um, so I think that's an excellent point. Um, in regard to the question about um, people who say that Marxism is not for black people, they say it's a white theory. Here I would just, this is one of my favorite quotes from the essay that we read by Rodney, where he says, um, 
if people still say that Marxism of white, he says, one would have thought if the ideology of Marxism is to be colored by the color of the majority of its adherents, then Marxism is to be called a yellow ideology. Because here he's referring to, in this text, 800 million Chinese people who have embraced Marxism. And he goes on to say, and if it is a yellow ideology or is capable of being yellow, and, it, it, and that if it is capable of being brown in the case of some Asian countries, of being black in the case of Cabral's Guinea or of Mozambique under Felimo, then immediately one sees that there are very many breaches that are made in this wall which was being built, or which certain people attempt to build, to, uh, to, to build around Marxism to keep it from the world's least developed people. So, I mean, to me, that's a, you know, a really succinct answer to this question in the sense, and I, but I also think that this is backed up, again, by what we referred to earlier, by Rodney's insistence that Marxism is not some kind of ideology, I mean, excuse me, dogma, that could just, you know, that it has a fixed form that is then exported to other parts of the world, but rather a methodology that um, demands the concrete analysis of concrete uh, struggles as they've developed in particular social locations, right? And so in that regard, and that's why he himself, as a black Marxist, you know, it argues for the power of, of Marxism to understand, you know, in, in his extensive analyses of African societies, for example. And I also just wanted, you know, to note that I really, this, this idea of Marxism being a white ideology, of course, comes up all the time. It's kind of one of the, you know, automatic reflexes that we often hear that sometimes, like, goes under the guise of being politically correct or something like this. But I find it to be an incredibly racist assertion because it just completely invisibilizes the absolutely essential contributions to the history of Marxist thought that have been made by black people, that have been made by brown people, that have been made by people from around the world. It's an inter, you know, it is a global, um, uh, you know, collective project. And, and, you know, and there's lots of um, excellent scholarship that has, you know, really detailed, like, the specific contributions to Marxist-Leninism made by uh, for example, um, uh, African struggles and thinkers. Um, and the same thing goes for the kind of, you know, myth of like bro Marxism that ignores all the contributions of women to the history of developing Marxism. And so this is something that um, I think really has to also be addressed for the kind of really racist presumptions that, that I think are folded into these kind of assertions. Yeah, one of the other things that Rodney points out, of course, is that no one's worried about. Uh, using electricity because it was purportedly invented by a white man. And if we take science seriously, then science is a method that should be universally applicable with adaptation to different circumstances. And I'd also like to insist on uh, one of the points that Jennifer touched on is that it's, it's not only theoretically that there have been so many contributions from people around the world, but practically speaking, Marxism has been at the vanguard of anti-racial national liberation struggles of literally millions and millions of people. And so the idea that it would somehow be Eurocentric or European or trapped in white ways of thinking is just completely ignorant of the real practical struggles of actual people. And that, I think, is extraordinarily important. Look at the history of the CPUSA and their efforts to desegregate the United States not in the 1960s, but in the interwar period. And they were at the forefront of that movement. Uh, and there's many, many other examples that we could point to, but maybe just in the interest of time, I'd like to cycle back to the question regarding tactics, which I thought was a really well formulated. I think it's true that within the Marxist tradition, self-critique is its lifeblood, meaning that one of the ways in which Marxism develops collectively as a science is reflecting on and criticizing where there have been shortcomings in various ways. Jennifer referenced this with Lenin's very important critique of the Marxist Second International, uh, which really set the stage for a much more uh, anti-racial form of Marxism focused on national liberation and that the struggle was not only a class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but a class struggle between nations, meaning imperial nations versus those that were subjected to imperialism. And that, uh, I think, is, is essentially important regarding the possibility that tactics do not kind of ultimately contradict the strategy, but they've gone, they've kind of veered off the path. It's a really difficult question. 
regardless of what I say, I'm not going to resolve it because that question is resolved by class struggle, right? Not by a professor sitting in a room saying this or that. But I do think that the framework of judgment is really important and that Lesordo and others like him are very helpful in that regard. And that is that since we live in a system that is dominated by capitalist imperialism, one of the central questions always has to be, is it better to have a socialist project that is so wracked with contradictions that it doesn't seem to be advancing in the direction that it should be going in? Or would it be better to have that country just integrated within the imperialist framework? Mm -hmm. That should be the question, I think, because it's not a question of absolutes, like this is real socialism and this is not. It's a question of the extant imperial system and how a particular struggle is situated within that. And there's lots of important and difficult debates, right? We could take the example of Nicaragua currently, right? Is it, would it be better if Nicaragua is just integrated within the capitalist system? Or would it be better that the Sandinista government, with all of you know, certain problems and critiques that, that many people have from different vantage points, continues to try to pursue a socialist project? Personally, I think that socialism, rather, the, the, even in uh, certain forms that aren't, again, living up to a perfect standard, is preferable to integration with the imperialism. But again, it also begs the question of what about cases where it is actually quite severe, right? And so I do think there needs to be space to be able to say, no, in certain instances, this really veered off the path. The example that comes to mind is the, the social chauvinism of the Second International. Uh, I do think that there, that was an attempt to develop a form of socialism within the imperial core based on the labor aristocracy that was perverted and therefore needed to be subjected to the most radical forms of critique, which is what Lenin undertook. Uh, and of course, we'd have to talk about other issues, uh, or other cases, and take it on a case-by-case -case scenario. Regarding the situation in the Ukraine and Russia, which relates to this other question, I think it's very clear, and I've written uh, at least one, I guess, long piece on this, but done a fair amount of research into the contemporary situation in the Ukraine, and I think it's clear to anyone who's doing a materialist analysis that this is a US-driven, NATO-overseen, proxy war in which Ukraine is being used as a leverage point for a war against Russia that is ultimately the war against China, which is the new Cold War that is the old Cold War. And so geopolitically, that's what is going on. In the case of Russia's decision to undertake a military intervention in the Donbass region, this was in response to the 2014 Maidan coup, which is a fascist coup based by the, backed by the United States. And the Russian dominant majority within the Donbass region was subjected to uh, terroristic policies on the part not only of the Ukrainian government, but also of the fascist forces in the Azov Battalion, which are, uh, well, were an extension, uh, or, I'm sorry, they began as fascist forces and then many of them were integrated into the, the National Guard in the Ukraine, and 14,000 people were killed in that war. So it goes back to 2014, and there were also a whole series of promises that were made by the Western world when the Soviet Union was dismantled that NATO would not extend you know, one inch to the east. And of course what we've seen is massive NATO expansion to the east. NATO is an imperial project that has its roots in the history of the US support of fascism, and the number of fascists directly integrated into NATO is very, very well documented. And the current situation in the Ukraine is Zelensky canceled the elections. Right? Elections are over with. After having banned all opposition parties, thrown in prison the leaders of opposition parties, taken over the mass media so that it's centrally controlled by the state, and allowing and developing a cultural fascism that works hand in glove with a militant fascism of various military brigades, the Azov, the Adar battalions, and others, right sector, etc. And so in that regard, you have a very good example of a totalitarian state that is being driven by US imperial interests. Does all of that mean that then we have to say Russia's intervention in the Ukraine was absolutely justified and we should, should support Russia in the, the war in the Ukraine? Personally, I don't think that follows as a necessary consequence. I think that you can understand why Russia has done that, because they didn't want ballistic missiles. They, they knew, I mean, Russia's been, look at the history of Russia. If you know the history of Russia and prior to that, the Soviet Union, that Eastern Europe has been the launching pad for military endeavors against Russia throughout the entire 20th century. They see the writing on the wall. 
Do you think NATO is going to stop at Ukraine? No. The plan is take over Ukraine, uh, break up Russia, and eventually do the war against China. That is the plan. And they're already planning the war against China, which is very, very explicit. And so I think you can see all of that without then somehow being a Putin puppet or an apologist for Russia. Putin is a capitalist. He was part of the regime that dismantled the Soviet Union. The things that he'd said, I mean, it's just absurd things about how the fault of, uh, you know, the reason that we have Ukraine is because of Lenin in the first place. And I mean, he's very much broken with any of the kind of uh, Bolshevik uh, orientation. And just a final thing in this regard is one of the things that, of course, a lot of analysts of contemporary geopolitics are talking about is the emergence and the very real existence of a multipolar world. And so Russia is a capitalist world that makes decisions that I don't fully agree with. I think a peaceable situation in the Ukraine would be much preferable. But at the same time, it's an emergent power that is saying no to US-driven imperialism. And ever since it started saying that in Syria, it has been in the crosshairs of US imperialism. And so one of the things that we have to factor into in the building of a socialist world is the emergence of a multipolar world in a very specific context in which it's not that you have the, the socialist bloc and the capitalist bloc like you had you know, for the large part of my generation. Now what you have is the US as the leading capitalist force, China as the leading socialist force, and a multipolar world in which there's a whole series of countries that after decades and decades of destabilization efforts, death squads, CIA coups, is saying, basta, we are not taking it any longer. And those, a lot of those countries are countries that I wouldn't agree with and support based on their internal politics. If we're talking about Iran, if we're talking about Russia, or other places like this. But at the same time, they're part of an emergent multipolar world. And the multipolarity is a way of leveraging power against imperialism. In that regard, I think that you have to see the kind of bigger picture in order to, uh, to frame all of that. Obviously, it's a complicated question. You know, there's a lot that goes into this, so we can unpack it in further detail, but I'll stop there. I know there's at least one more question. Are there any others that we should squeeze in? We're gonna try to do a hard stop at seven, but we can, we can move through. Okay, we're gonna talk quickly then. Uh, why don't we go uh, online first to Ben? What's that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, my question has to do with uh, one of the readings, the Walter Rodney reading brought up, uh, especially the need to apply Marxist methods to your own situation and uh, the society that you are that you're in. So, my question, kind of touching on that, and my question is, how do we determine kind of what the primary contradictions are or what the main issues are uh, when things are very complex and ongoing and our information is incomplete about them. And specifically, I'm wondering about, like, in the U.S. context, I mean, thinking about the U.S. imperialist state, there's so much secrecy around, like, the national security state. So it seems so difficult to try to, to get a sense of, like, what it's actually doing um, ongoing. Uh, like you mentioned the kind of CIA cultural cold, cold war fronts of uh, you know, using journalists and setting up, uh, setting up literary journals and things like that. And a lot of that took quite a while to come out for us to like, establish a lot of good account of that history. Um, so I'm wondering, like, how do we analyze the current ongoing processes in imperialism um, where we might be able to establish certain facts, uh, but it's difficult to get a bigger picture of what's going on. Um, how do we address that issue of incomplete or unorganized information about the world or the society we're living in currently in general, and for the US context specifically, uh, that issue of secrecy in particular? Great. In the, in the interest of time, are there any questions that people would want to hold for later? We'll do some urgent questions. We're just, it's also in the interest of having drinks in the park and having more informal <laughs> conversations. So it's not against your best interest, hopefully. <laughs> Joelle, you want to get, yeah? I'd just like to comment on something. Yeah. Everybody got the lesson, I think. Yeah, uh, the, the, there were two points that I thought I could uh, comment uh, on them because the research that you guys do uh, it's not the same as the one I do, but they are really complementary. And 
And that point of Marxism as being like Western centric, uh, something more uh, white, um, co connects to the, the second point which relates to the uh, cultural road war. Uh, and as capitalism is worldwide, is a tra transnational mode of production, there is ontologically um, a, a different condition, a condition in which it becomes um, a primary contradiction uh, socially. In, in this regard, Marxist is kept this critique and as a method, and it is necessarily supersedes secondary, tertiary uh, contradictions. And then I go back to the cultural co uh, world war uh, because I think a great example is Lukács because in the West there is two Lukács. A Lukács which celebrated this year makes it's 100 years from, from his uh, Geschichte and Klasse mit Busan, in History and Class Consciousness. And this, this uh, work for him, for, from him was really celebrated. It still is if you read uh, critical theory. Um, they still speak about this work, and they disregard the later works from, from Lukács. And Lukács himself, uh, shortly before he, he died, it was in six, 67, he wrote a new preface, preface to, to this work, in which he criticized immensely and said he couldn't identify himself with that. It was uh, like mystical, um, mystical way of, of, of relating. And there was one thing that was important in that work, or you know, okay, the waters were one thing above the, uh, above them all, and was the question of method, uh, like uh, also we saw in the text that we read for for today. And then his uh, his capolavoro, his 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 most important work, which was left as a manuscript, uh, was it was in German, and it was only published in German. Uh, of, around 15 years after his, his death. In Italian, it was partially uh, published for around four years after his death. And so, one, one would have only to type and publish, but you know that was the, the climate in, of the co cultural Cold War. And then, uh, Lukács, one of the most important Marxists, and with a, a, a message that contradicts the message of uh, messianism, in which would, um, yeah, would, would relativize, uh, uh, let's let's say the, or would, would would turn socialist struggle not in something revolutionary, but in something mystical. That was kept, and the the in his ontology when he brings back the question of method really extensively and uh, dissecating Hegel, Aristotle, uh, Kant, and and so on in regard to Marx and, and the contributions of, of them, them all and the, and the question of, of this point in regard to uh, revolution and social change this is completely obliterated and now, nowadays these works are available and even if you say there's nothing in my language but okay we have so many tools with digital uh, in the digital sphere and still it's ignored uh, so I think it's really interesting how, how these points connect and uh, I see that how, how concrete it is because Lukács, if, uh, after Lenin, was probably the, the greatest Marxist in the 20th century. And yeah, it's still uh, disregarded yeah, or, or ignored yeah. broadly. Armando, do you want to? Um, yeah, maybe question? you can answer, choose if you want to answer it. Um, it's more, it's not really a theoretical question, I guess. I was just wondering, um, this, both of you mentioned you underwent quite a ideological journey, let's say. I was wondering within we, which context um, these changes are shaped and within which um, practical context your knowledge is like shapes, uh, produce, distribute, etc. Like I, I know, Jennifer, you said you're a teacher, both of you organize this workshop every year. Um, I've seen some of your writing, writings in various places, uh, including the, what is the Liberation News, like the PSL um, newspaper. So I'm wondering, yeah, what... Yeah, so I'm wondering, yeah, what are those practical contexts if you want to go into that? I can be really quick because we have to get out in five minutes. Uh, <laughs> so the primary contradiction, I think, in the global system that we live in is between imperialism and anti-imperialism. That's the struggle, and it has been that way for 100 years. 
And regarding the difficulty of getting the kind of bigger picture uh, concerning what intelligence agencies are doing and things like this, of course, this is an ongoing epistemic problem. But if you study those histories, there are very, very clear patterns and structures of probability. And it's important to be able to uh, take positions regarding probable knowledge claims that aren't certain. For instance, it was probable that the United States was behind the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline. Now, it's basically been proven by Seymour Hirsch. And that I expected, because I know those patterns. So that's a very important thing in relationship to intelligence agencies. I couldn't agree more about Lukács, and I would say the exact same thing about Gramsci. Right? Gramsci's been made into a Western cultural Marxist who's all about hegemony and whatnot, and the fact that he was a Leninist who is actually part of the Communist International and theorizing fascism on the ground in relationship to concrete militant practice is written completely out of the equation. The very last thing, it's a complicated question. I would say if I had to give one single answer to it, it's due to the impact of radical young activists who yearn to change the world and demonstrated that in such a way that it brought me more into a particular struggle in ways that I think my own petty bourgeois indoctrination had made me hesitant to embrace. There are, of course, other factors, because, you know, but if I had to highlight one, that's what I'd say.